Coming up on this week's show, author E. Davies is here to talk about Freedom, the latest in his F Word series. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 249 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff Adams, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join the community at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. Well, Rainbow Romance readers, here we are. Another week, another episode. We've got lots of great stuff for you. So let's get to it. Yes. Something we're super excited about is that the film Something Like Summer, which is based on Jay Bell's best-selling book, is finally available for everyone to see. We originally saw this wonderful film back in 2017 at Outfest in Los Angeles during one of its festival screenings. And now it is available on Amazon, Google Play, YouTube, and iTunes. So you could finally see how this wonderful book got adapted into a film. And we really, really enjoyed it. The screen adventures of Ben and Tim and Jace turned out oh so well. You can actually catch our interview with Jay back in episode 96. We talked about the Something Like series. We talked about the film, about the comic adaptation. And uh, if you didn't catch that interview originally, we highly recommend it and that you go check out something like Summer. It's very much on our summer watch list so that we can check it out again. So something that we watched this past week was the Noah's Ark reunion episode. If there's one thing that the coronavirus has done, it has pushed creatives to utilize technology in brand new, innovative ways to bring entertainment to the masses. And thankfully, Patrick Ian Polk, the creator of Noah's Ark, has found a way to gather up his amazing cast once again and bring us a brand new episode. Yeah, it was really great to see what Patrick did here. There was already talk of getting the cast together for a Q&A to celebrate the 15th anniversary, which is happening this year. But they went one step beyond to bring us a look at what Noah and his friends are doing in pandemic times and in times of Black Lives Matter. It was really incredible, the script that got put together for this, to show us how these people that we knew so well back in the middle 2000s are handling current times and what they're going through and what they're feeling and also picking up their story. Once again, you get an idea of kind of where life is for all of these characters since we last saw them, which was in actually a movie that had come out to kind of wrap up the original series. Really so great to get back together with these folks and a really powerful episode, too, that addressed the things that are happening right now. If you want to know more about Noah's Ark, which was one of our very favorite series from 2005-2006, we're actually going to be talking more about its anniversary in our Patreon bonus episode for July, which will be dropping this week to our Patreon community. So you could check that out if you want to at patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. So, of course, as we talked about last week, it is July, and we are celebrating Christmas in July all month long. And Will has dipped into the holiday book bag again and has another great book for us to talk about. Yes, Santa definitely delivered an ultra sweet treat for me because I read What Happens at Christmas by Jay Northcote. (sighs) (laughs) Sometimes you just pick up a book and it makes you feel all the feels and gives you all the comfort of a satisfying cup of cocoa. The story centers on Justin, a nice guy who has just been dumped by his boyfriend. But luckily, his best friend, Sean, is coming to stay for the holidays. Sean has spent the last couple of months backpacking across Europe. He has finally made his way home to London, but quickly finds himself wrapped up in a fake boyfriend scheme. It seems Justin's ex is going to be at the office Christmas party, and he doesn't want to go without a handsome boy on his arm. So they agree to play the happy couple for one evening. The evening goes wonderfully. Not only does the ex get his comeuppance, but our two heroes discover that they enjoy pretending to be boyfriends. And after celebrating the holiday with Justin's office mates, they go home and tumble into bed together for the very first time. Now, this hookup leaves them very happy and very satisfied, but each of them is hesitant to 
really express how they've actually been feeling for quite some time. So initially, they brush it off as a one-time thing. But when a snowstorm prevents Justin from going home for the holidays, the two of them end up spending a couple of days cuddled up in his cozy London flat, where they're finally able to admit the feelings that they've had for each other all along. This story is filled with so much Yuletide happiness. I really loved Justin and Sean so very much. The story is a really interesting combination of super sweet, schmoopy holiday goodness, but really hot, sexy times as well. These two characters make up for lost time. And like I said, this was like the perfect sweet read that I really needed right now. If you're looking for drama or pain or angst, I don't know what to tell you. This is not (laughs) it. But if you're looking for two nice guys being nice and falling in love, then I highly recommend What Happens at Christmas by Jay Northcote. That sounds utterly delightful. And of course, right up your alley, that fake boyfriend thing, it's such crack. And then you wrap it up in the holidays. It's just like, oh, so I had my own feels going on this week as I emerged myself in the young adult debut from TJ Klune. I fanboy over TJ a lot on this show, and boy, did that continue with The Extraordinaries. Ever since he mentioned he was doing Young Adult, I have eagerly anticipated the release of this book. And now that it comes out this week, the world now has a gay superhero YA story with a neurodiverse main character that is filled with everything that I expect from a master storyteller like TJ. Dick Bell is obsessed with The Extraordinaries, the superheroes and villains Uh, that are in his town of Nova City. There's Shadowstar, who is the one that Nick writes wildly long fanfic about. And then there's Shadowstar's nemesis, Pyrostorm. Nick's friends aren't quite sure what to make of his fixation on these supers, but they accept it because he's got amazing friends. There's Seth, who he's got a major crush on and can't quite decide how to deal with that. There's Owen, the guy he used to go out with, who still hangs around with the crew. There's Jazz and Gibby who are in a relationship themselves. These friends are super tight, and it's exactly the friend group that you'd want to have in high school. They're silly, they watch out for each other, and they'll call you out if you're not doing the right thing. Nick lives with his very supportive dad. Dad's a police officer with the Nova City PD. He is not a fan of the Extraordinaries because they tend to cause havoc in the city. Even more so lately, as their battles have gotten a lot more intense, this book really blew my mind in the best way possible. Every time I thought I knew what was happening and where the story was going to go, I was so totally wrong, and I love that. Now, Nick and his dad have been figuring out really how to live together and get along together in the time since Nick's mom died in a car accident a few years back. They do really well on most days. But there are days that everything kind of piles up and things get said that they don't really mean. It's really an amazing, realistic portrait of a family that's been upended. So much of this book feels for me we're locked up in the relationship between Nick and his dad. They love each other so much. They don't want to disappoint the other. But some days those words just don't get said and hurt feelings happen Nick is really pushing on boundaries as he starts the new school year. His dad wants better grades. He wants Nick to be responsible and on time and do what he's supposed to do, which is easier said than done because Nick's brain races because of his ADHD. And while he is on medication, there are days that he doesn't take it because he doesn't want the numbed out feeling that it can sometimes give him. All of it's even more complicated when Nick gets into his head that he wants to become an extraordinary And to say that his plan to microwave a cricket so that it becomes radioactive and he can have a Spider-Man-like origin story is the least crazy thing that he does in this regard, which gives you some idea of what's to come for him. Like I said, The Extraordinaries takes on many twists and turns. I love that TJ has written a super intelligent, super aware young adult tale. These teenagers are equal parts observant and on point, and then at other times they are absolutely clueless. There are times I'd cheer for what they were doing, and other times that I would just groan and really wish they'd reconsider their plan. Nick goes into the lexicon of my favorite TJ characters, including Joe and Ox, Gus, Linus, and Mike. These are characters that get me right in the feels every single time. 
TJ gets deep inside Nick's head as he tries to figure out what's going on with the Shadow Star and Pyrus Storm fights, how he can be the person that his dad wants him to be, and what the heck is going on with Seth and how badly he wants to kiss that boy. Nick's brain won't stop, and that works to his advantage at least some of the time. And how TJ has captured Nick on the page, I think, is really going to speak to so many teenagers and what they go through, whether they're neurodiverse or not. The side characters are all fantastic here. I particularly like Nick's dad, who is really doing his best and clearly loves his son so much. Seth's guardians are also excellent, too. and Their peanut butter cookies sounded way too yummy. Best of all, as TJ has talked about in interviews on this show, there's no homophobia anywhere in this book. These characters are unabashedly queer, and that's never a thing, which is exactly how it should be. Now, if audio is your thing, you need to check out the amazing audiobook voiced by Michael Leslie. Michael's done a couple of uh, TJ's books and series in the past. His entire performance is exceptional here, but I really have to call out his portrayal of Nick and everything that goes through that kid's brain and spells out of his mouth. Michael added an extra punch to the words that TJ provided. So as you can tell, I kind of give my highest recommendation to TJ Clinton's The Extraordinaries. And the audiobook for The Extraordinaries is available through Libro.fm, where you can purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. With Libro.fm, you'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as that large audiobook company, but you'll be supporting a local bookstore of your choice. For example, our books that we buy through Libro.fm support Capital Books, which is located right here in our home base of Sacramento. All you need is the smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. Listeners of the Big Gay Fiction podcast can get a two-month audiobook membership for the price of one month when they join up. All you have to do for details on that is to go to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash Libro.fm. That's L-I-B-R-O-F-M for all the details. In The Hockey Player's Heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knauss, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart at Amazon.com Hi, I'm Jay from the LGBTQ romance review blog, Joyfully Jay. At Joyfully Jay, we review tons of LGBTQ romance, as well as romantic fiction and nonfiction. We review ebooks, audiobooks, and even the occasional movie. We typically review about 18 books a week, so Joyfully Jay is a great place to hear about new releases, catch up on books you may have missed, and find some new favorites. In addition to our reviews, each weekday, we host an author as our first post of the day. This gives readers a chance to learn more about new releases, get exclusive excerpts, find out about the author, and participate in great giveaways. Each author post on Joyfully J is exclusive, so you get access to book and author information you can't find other places. At Joyfully J, we love LGBTQ romance and are excited to share it with you. Stop by the blog at joyfullyj.com. You can also visit us on our Facebook group, The Joyful Jays. We'd love to have you join us. So I recently got to sit down with E. Davies to talk about so many things. We talk about Freedom, which is the latest book in his F-Word series. We talk about the Rosavia Royals shared universe that he recently played a part in, and so much more. It was a really great chance to get to learn more about Ed, and here's that interview now. Ed, welcome to the podcast. It is very good to have you here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we have so much to talk about because you've, you've yeah. got a lot of stuff that's come out this this past spring. Yeah. <laughs> and we should start with the most recent thing, which is Freedom, the, mm -hmm. the fifth book in the F Word series. And before we get into that book, tell us a little bit about what the series is about for anyone who may not be familiar. 
Well, so basically, in I started the series in early 2017, um, when I was kind of going through a tough time, and I wanted to see characters that were reflecting the things that I needed to see, like, out there in the world, but I wasn't really seeing very often an MM, and so I wrote Flaunt, which was a femme for femme story, where a femme cis guy meets a trans guy post-transition who wants to explore his femininity now, and they kind of help each other through that process, because that was exactly what I was working through at the time. And then in the process of writing that book, I accidentally made a found family because they do that in all of my books. So it ends up being like about this group of guys who work at an HIV charity in LA. So I kind of saw the chance to continue the story and make it a series. So now the F word books include like a gender fluid character, lots of femme guys, HIV positive guy. One of them has OCD, a pregnant trans man. So a really diverse cast um, of characters that I didn't see very much. And I think it's become known as my series with trans guys because there's at least one non-binary or trans main character in every single book. And three of them now have trans men in them. <laughs> I, I like that these diverse type of characters come forward in mm-hmm. your stories. Because as you said, you don't see as much of that. I, th- I think there's a little more now, but it's still mm-hmm. an evolving sort of character type that we're seeing in MM. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there wasn't very much in it in 2017 because my first trend book was actually July 2016. And that's when I wrote Grind, uh, which was the last book in my Valley Brothers series. And a lot of people said that was the first trans book they'd read. And I went to look at other trans books and there just wasn't that much out there. And I really kind of wanted to make a little bit of headway in introducing people to these characters, especially. And then at the same time, I was also noticing how these other things that I wasn't really seeing very much. And I said, well, these are the sorts of people that I have around me in real life. So why wouldn't they also be in books? <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. To bring that representation forward is great so that everybody kind of sees themselves in a mm-hmm. book. Yeah. What do you hear from readers as you expose them potentially to these types of characters for the first time? Because they may not know these people in real life at all. Yeah, I think it's been really validating, I think, for me, because I've seen such great feedback on them. I think in particular, there's a lot of parents who read the story and they either have a trans kid or they um, have friends, their their kids have trans friends or whatnot. And this is something that none of us really get, you know, grow up being taught. And so they don't have that language and they want to learn more. And I know, like, from my parents as well and from the people I know, one of the biggest worries that a lot of parents of trans kids have is that their their kids are not going to be happy or healthy or safe or loved. Those are, like, the big four things. And I wanted to show characters being all of the above. So I've had a lot of tremendous feedback, which has been phenomenal, with people saying that they now they understand their kids better, or their kids' friends, or other people in their life, like in their workplace, or in their schools, or their siblings. And I think it's really important because... It's over 80% of Americans don't know that they know a trans person personally, even though I think a lot of people might actually know a trans person, they might not be out, or they might be stealth, or they might be closeted or whatnot. So they don't have someone around them to kind of go, oh, yeah, it's, you know, that this is something that's around me in everyday life. And so people want to seek out the fiction to find out more about it and to get sort of the inside perspective on it. And that's kind of the perspective that I approached writing the series as a whole and what inspired it, I guess. <laughs> How do you approach writing characters that are outside of your own life experience with some of those characters? The same way I would say with pretty much any book, but with more caution. So starting off by recognizing where my experiences are similar and where they differ, um, especially when you get some of the bigger privileges that I have, like my whiteness, for example, Um, a lot of black trans people, like black trans men and black trans women might have more in common than white trans men and black trans men do uh, because of that anti-blackness, for example. So I have to acknowledge where I've had bad experiences that would have been much worse if I didn't also have these other privileges. And I think that's a really important first step because a lot of us kind of assume, especially in the queer umbrella, that if you're queer, then you can kind of talk about everything that's queer. And that's not necessarily the case because we can have really vastly different experiences under the same umbrella. So I start off there and then I look for personal accounts. I talk to friends. I look for like online blogs and that kind of thing. I try not to sort of burden people with the one-on-one questions. I try to do that, you know, the the, the initial education myself. And then if I'm lucky enough to know somebody who fits into one of those groups, I can kind of bring the more advanced questions to them. But I try not to sort of be like, you know, sit me down and explain all of this to me for free, please. Emotional labor that people do and I end up having to do sometimes in my life. So I try not to put that on other people. 
And I also try to just get a range of stories because I know this, like from my own marginalizations, for example, like there's a bunch of different ways that you could tell a trans story, which are all true. And they all like, they all fit within the range of a plausible life experience for people, but they might actually contradict each other. They might be, go down very vastly different paths. So I try to seek out like a range of voices of some people will have very different experiences when they face the same thing than other people. And I try to set my story. I don't know necessarily whether I set it sort of to one end or the other end of a spectrum or what's going on exactly. But I try to kind of see that things plausible before I go ahead and write them. <laughs> what kind of, I guess, extra time does that add to a book for you to take care of all those items wherever it falls within your writing process? Not that much, actually, surprisingly. I think because I've put a lot of effort into this sort of work in my everyday life, like outside of writing a particular book. So I've taken a great deal of care over the last uh, maybe five or 10 years-ish since I kind of started to be exposed to more diverse people and outside the sort of like tiny white small hometown that I spent some of my teen years in and so on where these narratives just weren't getting through I realized how much I didn't know and I went and tried to seek out these things so I've got luckily a pretty broad base of knowledge around a bunch of different things now because I've spent so much time in especially my late teens early 20s kind of seeking people out and listening and trying to figure out the privileges that I have, as well as my marginalizations. So when it comes to an individual story, I now have a little bit of a foundation, like I know where to go to look for more, where I think it takes a lot of time if you're at the beginning of that process, because you don't even know the language that you need to know to look up the things that you need to know. And like that is really slows you down as you try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about freedom. What's happening in this book? Well, this particular book, I took two characters who kind of seem to have very opposite backgrounds, but they actually end up kind of having a lot in common. Both Henry and Jaden need to find freedom in their own way, and they help each other do that, which is kind of the underlying message in most of my books, really. I think it's a surprisingly joyful story because it's an F-word book, and that's one of my messages of the series. So Jaden has agoraphobia and he gets panic attacks, but he's been in therapy for quite some time and he's ready to push himself and to kind of take the next step and trying to get into the world and he's getting a therapy dog, uh, or a service dog, sorry. And he's kind of at a stage in his life where he wants to sort of step out and push himself. And he's been really relying on his big brother who actually in the beginning of the story pushes him a bit too far without his say so. So he ends up having to kind of make those boundaries clear. And then Henry is a wilderness guide who's post-transition and he hasn't dated since his final stage of bottom surgery. So he's a little bit nervous about dating and he's really thrilled when the first date goes well. And kind of as part of that, but also as a result of where in his life he finds himself, he's, he decides that he wants to come out of stealth mode. So that he kind of feels like he's in the closet all over again now. Um, he wants to live openly as a trans guy. But he's kind of worried about telling his best friend and his boss, who are the people he's around the most. So he has to figure out how and when to disclose. So both of them are kind of in the same process of finding freedom, even if, even if it's in very different ways. And I think it's one of my best books. I'm really proud of it and how it came out. I love that I finally got to write a character who was post phalloplasty because that's really rare. Bottom surgery in general, with trans guys, is just not written about much. The two main types, meta and phallo, I've already written a post meta character in blunt, but not phallo. So getting to write this was really rewarding because there are so many myths out there and so few lived experiences about what it's actually like day to day. And so much of the information out there is just dry surgical statistics and complication rates and that kind of thing, not the actual experience of what it's like to live in this body. And so, so many people just don't think that it's possible to have a satisfactory result at all. And that's just not necessarily true. That's something that I got caught up in for years and years because we're so locked into cis normative ideals about bodies and about what trans people are supposed to want and how we're pressured into wanting to pass. And there's just no space for trans people to live. <laughs> and I wanted to create that space and I wanted trans guys to have that fantasy as well, because why shouldn't we get that fantasy too? Like we can have the sexual life of your dreams and the romantic partner of your dreams. And a books don't necessarily have to be about how there's always something missing and, you know, that kind of thing. That's, I find really disempowering. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the power of, I think, the romance book is you get to write and show characters of all kinds having a full, rich life. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are always the problems that show up in a romance book because you've got to hit those beats, but mm -hmm. they have a full, rich life. Yeah, and you have more, you have some flexibility on what those beats are exactly. 
because like when I started writing the F-word series, I was stealth. So that means I was living in my new identity without disclosing my gender history. And so it was one of my only outlets to really process what was happening to me, like not just the everyday experiences of being read as male and perceived as male and learning how to get around in the world as male, especially within the gay male sort of subculture. And then the deep stuff, like the compromises that I was having to make to get the medical treatment I needed. So I wanted that to sort of be in the book's as this kind of constant background noise that we experience it as, but I didn't want to exploit those moments for narrative tension the same way that I've seen a lot of cis writers do, because I find it really awful when I see the big moments are always, you know, outing or dead naming characters or, you know, the boys don't cry, God help me, <laughs> that film, you know, that is sort of where we come from, but that's our only representation. So I wanted something different. So like stories that lift me up and show the possibilities of gender euphoria, not just dysphoria. And, you know, yeah, just show not just fellow trans people, but also those who know and love us, like what life is like from the inside, where a lot of stories kind of talk about trans people using the language that we use to describe ourselves to cis people, which necessarily is going to be sort of simplistic, sort of 101, sort of relatable to cis people. But and sometimes that language doesn't actually really reflect how we experience life at all. This is just sort of how we get other people to understand in their own way, where we have such a different sort of tapestry of things going on that we're worried about. So I wanted our books like to have that tapestry of things going on, but not be unrelatable or difficult to understand or whatnot. So it's a, it's a ton of work, but it's really rewarding to get to write those stories from the inside as both a mirror and a window. <laughs> and I love that analogy you just did, the mirror and the window. Yeah, I don't know where I picked it up. I think it was on Twitter somewhere. But basically, it was um, that diverse stories are either a mirror so that you can see yourself in the story. Or if you're not one of the people in the story, it's a window so that you can see into another life. And I find that so powerful. And I want the stories mm -hmm. to be both a mirror and a window. So it takes some crafting to try to make sure that they they don't alienate one group or another. But it's really worthwhile. <laughs> mm -hmm. It sounds like these might almost be like your your almost favorite series to write because of what it does and the and the stories that it represents mm -hmm. not to put words in your mouth <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think so actually it's uniquely difficult to write in because of, i have to be in the right headspace um and freedom actually started off with a short story two years ago and I was going to immediately turn it into a novel because I knew that there was the rest of the story to tell but at that point in my life I just wasn't ready to do that and I was also pre-surgery myself so I felt like I didn't know the things that I needed to know to show you know life on the other side yet so it was only afterward and then after I'd kind of dealt with all of the you know healing and the any sort of surgery is trauma as well. So I had to kind of deal with all of that like life effect. And then I sat down and went, oh no, now I'm ready for this book. Like this is, I think this book is something that I could only have written at this very specific moment in my life, but it's something that I needed to read two years ago. So it feels really important. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now it'll be there for somebody else mm -hmm. to find in the right time. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be more F word in the future, um, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I have several ideas that I really want to pursue but I just don't know when. Um, I kind of have to wait till I'm in the red, right headspace for each story. And but but I do want to keep telling stories about the the other the other aspect I think of the F word books is not just that it's showing diverse characters and trends and non-binary in particular, but it's also telling very particular stories about what queer and trans community and bound family can look like. And it's a sort of more queer community, I think, in F word, where it's more of a gay community in my other books, which is a distinction that I think I it's a difficult one to explain, but I think it resonates with a lot of queer people out there. And so I really want to tell more stories like from that side of the fence of what that looks like, but I just don't know when yet. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And hopefully you won't run out of appropriate F words. <laughs> <laughs> I have had that worry, but I have a long list. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Moving over to another recent book that you've put out, you were part of the Rosavia Royals uh, shared universe, and you wrote one called Barely Regal. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about the universe in that book. Rosevia Royals was such a satisfying series to work on. It was just, it was a dream because I've always wanted to like develop a fictional European country with its own royal family and its etiquette and history and culture and like, you know, the favorite foods that everybody's got and everything. Like all of that stuff is just so cool. And getting to do that in conjunction with a bunch of other really cool authors is 
just phenomenal. Getting to build the family relationships between the different princes was the best. So basically what we did was we created five fictional princes and the oldest to the youngest who are all in line for the Reservian throne, they're our brothers. And then each of us took one of the brothers and wrote their book. So we had to work really closely together to develop this royal family and our own characters and crossover characters. So we have a lot of secondary characters and locations that show up um, in all the book, because they all happen in the same two weeks leading up to the royal ball in Rosavia. And at the royal ball, the oldest prince is expected to announce um, his engagement, even though he's kind of a playboy and the sort of irresponsible rebel heir. So all the other princes have this idea of him as being this like really flighty, unreliable guy, but he's actually kind of got his own story too. And so you, you get to see his story and him kind of stepping into his responsibility. And then all the other guys reacting to their own circumstances so for me, I chose Barely Regal, and it was the moment I saw the book, they actually started as book covers, we bought them as five pre-made book covers, and the moment I saw the cover, I was like, that one's mine, and I'm writing it, and the title is going to be Barely Regal, and the book just came out fully formed like that. <laughs> I knew that I was going to choose the youngest prince and make him like the bratty youngest boy, and so like, you know, just turned 19 and rebellious, and he doesn't see why his job, which is Commander of Roses, it just seems like this made-up thing, and he doesn't <laughs> see why that's actually important to the royal family and their history anyway. And his valet was the obvious choice for the daddy that he winds up in a relationship with. So Tom has his own scars because he was used by a more powerful boy before. So he's quite slow to trust. He doesn't want to get into that situation again. So a lot of the book is kind of that slow evolution of their relationship because they've known each other for a decade. And Tom sort of sort of taming Ren, but I don't think he can ever really tame a brat. And <laughs> always kind of knowing exactly what he needs and showing him because um, he can kind of sense what Ren is looking for before Ren even knows himself. So yeah, I'm really proud of the series and what we achieved together. And I'm super excited because it's actually coming out in audio. It's already been recorded by Kieran Flitton, who recorded Helen Juliet's Royal Books. And it's in review with Audible, so it could be out later next, later this month or next month. Uh, it's up to Audible right now, the review time. So. <laughs> it now it'll be out. <laughs> this week it could be next month, but I'm really excited because hearing it out loud was just like falling back into that universe all over again. I've kind of been living in for the last, really, since February. So <laughs> it's kind of, I don't want to extract myself now. I just want to live in that world. <laughs> yeah, living in a good royal, in a good royalty could be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it totally is. So that came together quick. If you've been living in it since February, we're only in June. That that sounds like that universe came together really quickly. Yeah, we were really lucky because we found the pre-made covers and both Helen and I, who had previously worked together on Men of Hidden Creek, happened to be awake at that time, happened to spot the covers and messaged each other going, oh my God, you know what we need to do. Yes, I know. <laughs> and so instantly we went, okay, shared universe, five authors, find three other people and both of us happened to be available to write books like we just tied up our last projects at that point which I think I had just finished up Freedom and I got into the editor and I was going okay what do I do next and so we were available to just jump in and so there was a case of messaging other people and finding out who was available like right now basically and it was kind of one of those stories aligning situations that we managed to get Stella Sterling, Zoe Don, who's a debut author, and then Max Rowan, who used to write as Max Hawthorne, uh, but had to change her name, who was in Men of Hidden Creek. So we managed to get her back as well. And we just got together what I feel like with the perfect combination of people to write each of those books at exactly the right moment. And we all just plunged in and we really wanted to write them simultaneously because we beta read each other's books. Um, that was really important to us was working together as we went along to build in all those crossovers because they're so very tightly connected. <laughs> working over a span of a two week story block in a small European island, it's all got to mesh together just right. That sounds like a lot of story Bible work. <laughs> it was. <laughs> the story Bible was our absolute savior. We started it when I think I was the first one to start writing and we started it right then and kept it updated the entire way through because there were so many moments of even just going, oh, I've got this thunderstorm happening on this Friday. So you've got to make sure that if you've got a scene happening on this Friday, there's a thunderstorm, you know, like there's really basic details. And we also had a phenomenal um, beta reader, Amy Patel, who works with Lice Court, was our absolute savior. The first book and really all of the books should be dedicated to her because she just kept us on track and she kept track of all of those crossover moments and went, oh, you know, if they're having this scene happening on this day, then these guys could actually be in the background. And like, she was so good with all these details. And I think every shared universe needs someone who's keeping track of that. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise it can just like, oh, I didn't know you did this over there. This one little moment. 
that yeah. becomes, you know, something that's screwed up somewhere else. Yeah, you need that continuity. Yeah. <laughs> and wonderful, they're coming out on Audible. Yeah, so we've got um, all five of them in various stages of recording. A couple of them already submitted. So we're really hoping to get them out pretty quickly. We've been lucky enough to get the audiobook to the narrator ahead of time to try and really reduce that gap mm. before the audio comes out. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm looking forward to that because I want to read these books. I love royal books and couples and all that stuff. And so that I, I, I look forward to binging them on audio. Now, speaking of binging, you also boxed up Significant Brothers, um, yes. and it's now fully available in a box set of ebooks as well as audio. Yeah, I'm really happy to show that. Um, it's been a couple of years since those books went live, about three years since the first one went live, and I'm one of those collectors who like needs to have everything in the same place myself, and it drives me nuts if I can't. And I only ever put Winter Suite, which is the follow-up novella, out on Amazon like briefly as a 99 cent thing. Um, but I'm really funny about putting things out that don't stand alone, and that book is a novella about the first guy's wedding, so it doesn't really stand alone. So I didn't really feel good like leaving it out there. So I'm really happy to like collect them all in one place. It's the the entire universe is there in one box set. And I wanted to put it in KU for binge reading and on Audible for one credit. And it's just, a, I think, a nice place to dive in, especially if you haven't read my books before. I think it's a really good introduction to that sort of low angst, feel good, found family, all that kind of stuff that defines my books. You can find it there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is like the trademark E. Davies book set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, like I've only ever written basically, I, I start apart from one or two little experiments, like pretty much all contemporary MM romance. So it's, I think the E. Davies book is feel good and low angst. I hear that a lot. Realistic yet optimistic, always steamy. Um, and the guys always seem to kind of fit together and find this mutually supportive, uplifting way of being together. And even when I try to write angsty books, like my after series, after Burn, after Glow, and after Math, um, or Redemption, I think those are probably the only books I have that I would call angsty, but they still end up kind of being like the low angst versions of angst. <laughs> For those who don't know Significant Brothers, uh, tell us a little bit about that series so people will know that they need to go pick this up. So it's a series about six guys who were high school best friends, and my the, the series title is actually my, one of my favorite parts about it. It's called Significant Brothers because they were all in high school together, and they'd all kind of found each other in high school, as queer kids tend to do, and flocked together, and they tried to go to the prom, except they were told, oh, you can't go to the prom unless you have a female date. You need to have a significant other. And they went, oh, well, what about Significant Brothers? And then that became their little friendship group name that stuck. And they stayed in touch, you know, over the years as they all kind of grew up and they found unusual careers. So we've got like a pilot and a race car driver and a zookeeper and a perk ranger who used to be an astronaut and all these other kind of really cool careers uh, that I had them going up to do. And then they've all kind of come back together now in their mid-20s as they kind of settle down a little bit in their hometown and find love. And I think it's a, yeah, it's a really kind of optimistic, sweet, low angst, sort of feel good ride through this universe. And each of the guys, like they always show up in each other's books. So you kind of end up collecting them. And then by the time you get to book six, you've got this huge collection of 12 dudes. <laughs> and they're all in the background of each other's stories, which is really fun. <laughs> and then the follow up novella, Winter Sweet, was about the first one's wedding. Uh, the last book in the series is Tremble, and that actually won the Rainbow Award for the best bisexual romance, which was fantastic. And yeah, it's, I think, a really good introduction to all things E. Davies. <laughs> now, you love working with tropes. Yes. You've got the Trope Finder on your website, which we will link people to, because I think that is such a great way to categorize books on an author website. <laughs> Do you have favorite tropes, or are you game to play with just anything? I kind of would say just anything because I just love the process of working with tropes and figuring out how to break a story down into tropes. I really love satisfying those expectations or subverting them and kind of playing with them. And I love like unusual combinations and the tried and true. Like I, I think ultimately I'm just a total sucker for like the cheesy and the camp and the unapologetic like pleasure like what some people call guilty pleasure but I don't believe in being guilty about it I just believe in being unapologetic about it so I like any trope that really fits into that genre of unapologetic pleasure feel good low angst I'm happy to work with so I tend to find like a lot of opposites attract and a lot of small towns 
I think small towns especially lend themselves really well to that found family feeling. And that's something that I just about everything I write ends up having a found family by the time I'm done the book, whether I mean to or not. <laughs> it's kind of one of the foundations of queer life, really, found family. So I'm not surprised that it's like a quintessential gay romance trope, I think. I end up having a lot of hook up to lovers as well, which is really true to the experiences that I see around me, like in my friendship groups and stuff as well. That feels like a really realistic thing. So yeah, I think a lot of the tropes are just inspired by what I see around me in everyday life and what I sort of aspire to see, like the optimistic happy endings. (laughs) What do you think are the two most, I guess I'll say opposite tropes that you've ever put together and had it work out? After like 45 books, you're straining my memory here. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Let me just look on the table behind me. I have some books out ready to be mailed here. Actually, I think Forever, which was my trans pregnancy romance, because I wanted to have a closeted sort of out for you-ish story and surprise pregnancy. And I think just MM in general doesn't expect surprise pregnancy to be a trope unless you're within MPreg. <laughs> and I really wanted to play with that. I wanted it to be, I wanted to show what can actually happen again with sort of realistic trans lives. Um, but I also didn't want the pregnancy to be forced upon him because I feel very strongly about that. And that's a sort of, it could be used as a very sort of struggle sort of trauma porn almost for trans characters and a lot of trans guys wouldn't feel great about surprisingly being pregnant so I wanted this to be a character who does actually want to have a child but he just gets pregnant earlier than he expected and he has to kind of rush to get his life together where he thought he had more time and then I put that together with the gay for you story because the two of them had met before and it's just sort of second chances as well because they didn't hook up the last time they met but then this time they managed to get to and then you know things happen and they end up having to deal with them. And I think that was a really, I think it came together perfectly because those tropes supported each other so well, actually. But they weren't, I think, tropes that you would expect to see together. (laughs) Right. I mean, about the closest you get an MM to a baby, a secret baby, because something happened in the Mm -hmm. the past before the story started, perhaps. Yeah. Or Um, you get like somebody might have a child already mm -hmm. and, you know, they've gotten divorced or whatnot and they end up kind of getting into a relationship with someone else. But I haven't really seen a romance that was driven by the main character getting pregnant by the other main character and then then figuring out, oh, what do we do about this? I think that was a really, that is something that happens in everyday trans lives and it's happened for a very, very long time. It's nothing new or shocking. You've got all these news articles about like the first pregnant trans man and there have been like at least three first pregnant trans men in the UK, (laughs) according to the headlines. Uh, But it's been happening forever and it's just not happening in books. So therefore I wrote forever. (laughs) What got you started in MM Romance? Well, I kind of grew up looking for gay books in the bookstore, and I didn't really know why. I wasn't sure why I was connecting so strongly to gay men, because I was denied that language to even understand my own identity until I was 20. But I was still seeking them out anyway, and they just weren't out there. There were like three books that were out there, and that was it, and nothing that really reflected my experiences. So I assumed they didn't exist, and I kind of gave up on looking. Um, And then when I was in on Amazon in 2013, I found gay erotica stories and I went, oh, this is where they're all hiding on Amazon. Okay. (laughs) And so I like sat down immediately that day and I finished an erotic short story that I kind of had had half done on my hard drive and published it. And then I did another and then I did about 40 more. And then I realized I was, I kept writing romances and not erotica and happy ever after endings. And that wasn't what people really wanted from erotica. So I was like, why not switch to romance? And I started to write MM romance novels instead. And now I'm up to about, I think, barely legal is number 45. And it just not never stopped. Congratulations. That's an awesome number. Thank you. It's been kind of overwhelming, but also just fantastic to get to live out all of these different lives and tell all these different stories. And I feel really strongly about romance in particular because it guarantees the happy endings that we've been denied for so long. And I want these stories to like reflect the life that I've experienced and my queer community and the friends around me but not sort of get bogged down in those mandatory sad endings and like give people hope. And I'm tired of stories where we have to suffer for being gay and trans and we have to like wrestle internally and hate ourselves and go through all of that angst and whatnot. Because I see the damage that that causes and I'm in the community watching the ripple effect of people hurting people because of all of that stuff. And I'm basically in my personal life and in books, I'm done with queer angst. So I was like, I'm just gonna keep writing (laughs) like safe, low angst, happy endings over and over again. And I feel like that's helping tip the scales in my own tiny way, just a little bit, the way that I needed them to be. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I feel that same way. I, I, I want to write the world as I kind of want it to be mm-hmm. more than it actually may be. 
Have you always been a writer? You mentioned having like these stories on your hard drive sitting there. <laughs> yeah, basically since I was like six or seven, I had this like little manila notebook in my parents' house of me writing a story about my better fish and I illustrated it as well. That was me like getting started with short stories. And then I kind of lost touch with it a little bit when I was in university because I was doing an English degree and I had to do all of the like literary analysis and all that kind of stuff and that really took me out of the sort of fun and pleasure of genre fiction and into the now analyze the color of the curtains style of writing <laughs> and so it took me some time to kind of like get out of that mindset again and then yeah I basically that was right about the same time I graduated in 2013 and then it was that September that I found um, my first short stories on Amazon and started to write them and just sort of plunged in and never looked back it's <laughs> wonderful Give us a book recommendation. What's like the last book that you read that you're just crazy about? So Ellen Gregory, she just re-released A Like It Two Bees, which is this little short story historical. So I'm rereading that later, actually, as my treat for like packing up a million books and shipping them overseas and I don't <laughs> do this to myself. But I did buy it because of the title I admit, and I'm like famously, I love bees. But I was kind of hoping there'd be like a beekeeper, but I was actually really happy with what I found instead. Um, this, this, it's this really lovely, gentle, historical story. And it has all of these gorgeous scene setting details and really tasty food. And I am a sucker for really tasty food I've discovered recently. So it really makes it sort of spring to life. But I wish, I, the only thing I'm unhappy about is the fact that it's like a short story and it's not this entire series because I wish you would write a whole series in that world. It's just this lovely little place to live for an afternoon. <laughs> nice. So what's coming up next for you? Well, actually, <laughs> funny you should mention that because I'm thinking about a story that involves food. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, like, at the moment, I'm actually writing my first non-romance book. So after these dozens of romance books, it's this really strange experience. But it's trans nonfiction. But it's going to be a while before that's ready because I want to... I'm considering publishing, like, traditional publishing. So it's going to take some time to get done and shop around and decide if I want to tread pub or self-publish and what, whatnot. So in the interest of publishing another book this year, <laughs> I'm putting it back on the back burner again in July and I'm kind of getting back to romance. So I currently have three standalones that are either planned or in progress. I think I'm going to do them before I dive back into series. But the first one is another sort of DS daddy boy dynamic book because so many people have said how much they enjoyed Barely Legal and I didn't quite get it out of my system. I think I still have some more stories to tell in that dynamic. So that's the book that's going to involve both food and daddies. So that seems like a really good combination. I think that's going to be my next book out, but it probably won't be until like August, September-ish. And then I'm going to follow that up with a couple more standalones that I've been wanting to write, but I've been kind of finishing off series for the last year or so. <laughs> Is there anything you could share more about the, the nonfiction? You piqued my curiosity there. Well, basically, I wanted to write a story about the surgery process that I've been through about sort of the, the questions that I wanted to know answers to that I couldn't find answers to anywhere. I've been doing some of that work in my fiction books by kind of giving people fictional representations, but I've got all these really interesting stories about this journey to surgery and like that's basically it's a book about my dick <laughs> is how I've been describing it to my friends. But it's also all of these little moments about how it's not like the it is a huge life changing surgery, but it's the process you have to go on before you get to that point. That's the more important thing. And I think that hints at a lot of the stuff I've seen. Like I recently watched the documentary Disclosure and it was all about, uh, there's a section about how interviewers had to focus on the surgery as like the big thing about us. But it's always done from a very cis viewpoint of like this one big thing that you go through and that's it. And that's what defines you, whether you're a man or a woman, blah, blah, blah. And like my process of going through that just broke all of those things to smithereens. So I kind of wanted to write about the funny side of life, the joyous side of life, the interesting things that happen, the like, the truth is stranger than fiction, I think, side of it, as well as sort of showing trans men who are looking at surgery that it's a huge surgery, but it's not the scary sort of, it's not the surgery that it was in the 80s or the 90s, because a lot of the myths that are persisting now, because of the stuff that used to happen back then, and a lot of the policing that kind of happens and what we're allowed to want and what we feel like this will result in, um, is very transphobic. And it's really steeped in these sentiments of what we're supposed to want. And I kind of want to write this like joyful, tongue in cheek, lighthearted, fun book, actually. And yeah, we'll see how it ends up taking shape. But that's the the, the general ballpark I'm writing in. And then if I end up working with a publishing house, I'll see how they want me to shape it and we'll go from there. <laughs> That's really excellent. I think that you're doing that. I mean, I, I have 
obviously no lens in that space at all, but just hearing you talk about that it's a book you wish you kind of had mm-hmm. means that there's other people out there who need that book really desperately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was only like a year ago that I was having this surgery and then like the months leading up to it, I was talking to my boyfriend at the time and saying how like scared I was and how uncertain I was, even though I was sure I wanted it, but I was uncertain about the results. And I just couldn't find that many sort of stories about what it was like to like afterward or what it was like to go through it. There's so much stuff that I had to join these like secret surgery groups and sort of interpret people's posts and so much stuff that just didn't make sense to me until I actually went through the process and went, oh, if someone had warned me about this, I might have like transferred all of my soup tins into like Tupperware containers I can open one-handed because I found myself like after surgery not being able to use one at home like wedging the corner of my soup tin in my sink trying to open it one-handed and stuff like all of these crazy little things that nobody had really warned me and I didn't really think about but I wish that I had been able to and as well I thought the bigger thing like how is it going to affect your sex life like so many people think oh well that's it like you just won't feel sensation anymore ever and that's not true anymore necessarily there are good surgeons out there who have microsurgery teams who can do wonders and we need to have higher expectations and we need to like join together as a community to demand those expectations not just kind of accept what's out there because it's their only choice because it isn't anymore and I feel quite Mm -hmm. strongly we should be talking about having high expectations and how we can best maximize our aftercare and how to talk to surgeons about what we want because surgeons like how do they Juno Moshe wrote this in Trans Power like how do surgeons decide what we want like, are they, where do they decide that the ideal dick comes from? Like, are they watching porn? Is it based on their dick? Is it based on, like, <laughs> if you actually think about that, like, how does that happen? Because I, sh- I know from my point of view, I didn't get to walk in and say, well, this is what I want. They basically mm-hmm. decided what I'm going to be given. So where did that come from? Like, how do we have conversations with surgeons, like, about whether the individual is more concerned about, quote unquote, passing or about standing to pee, or about sexual sensation, or about like the erectile device, or preserving original anatomy, like all of these things are actually options, they're not mandatory, like you don't actually have to go down this very prescribed strict path anymore, but there's still people who are kind of being forced down that path because the surgeons they work with, or the information sources that they have say you have to get this, 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 and this, and this, that's not true anymore. I want options for all of us. I want us to know what we can get and seek that out. I hope you get this book out soon because I can see it being really important to be out there. Yeah, I think it is. So I'm yeah. quite passionate about that. But that's kind of a backbone project again. It's quite difficult to kind of figure out what I want to say, how I want to say sure. it, and how personal I'm going to get because there's, a, you know, everyone's story involves real life and other people in their lives and how much of that I want to include and all that kind of stuff is difficult to figure out. But I think there's a lot of value in being vulnerable, even though it does mean being vulnerable on a scale I haven't been before because in my fiction, there's that lens or that, that sort of wall of fiction versus nonfiction and everyone understands. You might share experiences with the character, but not necessarily all of them whereas when you're writing non-fiction like that's it that's your life out there so it's very different I found as soon as I started like sat down to write this I went oh wow this feels really vulnerable and I've got a lot to work through in terms of figuring out how to how to choose my tone for this and how to mm-hmm. construct even every individual chapter. <laughs> I look forward to hearing more about this as you keep going with it. How can people keep up with you online, learn what fiction comes next, how the nonfiction project is progressing and and all that stuff? The best way is to join my Facebook group, which is called Ed's Petals. Um, I post flower and bee photos and I try to keep it like this lovely little low stress bubble. That's the only place that I've really been talking about this nonfiction project. And I also post like my new releases and sales and stuff in there. And... The other place that it's best to find out more is my newsletter, which is on my website, edavisbooks.com. That's where I send out like my freebies and deals and new release alerts and all that kind of stuff. You can subscribe on BookBub and Amazon, but they can be kind of hit and miss on sending out actual notifications and stuff. So my newsletter or the Facebook group is definitely the best place. (laughs) Perfect. We'll link up to all those plus all the books that we talked about. Ed, thank you so much for being here. It has been just wonderful talking to you. Thank you. It's been great talking to you too. Thank you for having me. (laughs) This week's interview transcript is brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks again to Ed for coming to talk to us. 
I loved hearing about his work. I can't wait for that Rosavia Royals series to come up on audio. I've been wanting to read that and to know that those are coming on audiobook made me so happy. And I'm really excited that he's working on that nonfiction book too. I can see that being a very meaningful book for people to read who are going through what Ed did in his transition. Yeah, and while I wasn't a part of the actual recording of the interview itself, I did listen to it and go over the transcripts, and I particularly loved the moment where Ed mentioned, I think he said he was done with queer angst. Mm -hmm. And if you know me, low angst, happy stories will always be at the top of my TBR. So thank you, Ed, for summing up my feelings so succinctly. I might put it on a t-shirt. Hashtag done with queer angst. I knew when he said that, the that would resonate with you so well. (laughs) All right, everyone. I think that'll do it for this week's show. Coming up next in episode 250, Nora Phoenix joins us to talk about the finale of her series, Irresistible Omegas. It was so wonderful to talk to Nora. We talked about not only the series, but we talked about tropes and power dynamics, her collaboration with KM Newhold. It was a really wonderful conversation. Yeah, you are not going to want to miss that. All right, everyone, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please stay strong, be safe, and above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 